Hello. Welcome to my sample video for my presentation on the topic of negotiation. This is another one of those topics where we can cover a variety of skill levels. So for novice negotiators, this could be sort of a training level presentation, and we can cover some of the common textbook sort of theory and tools over here. And for the more advanced professionals, the negotiating professionals, we can talk about some of the more advanced concepts and specifically some of the lessons learned and the experiential stuff. And as oftentimes I'm, I've done, I put some of the, the theory and the textbook stuff on the one side and we'll sort of gravitate over to the application-based content. And oftentimes over here I'll put something like common mistakes or, or experience sharing. Um, for this one on negotiation, I'm going to talk a little bit about people who negotiate in bad faith what they're oftentimes trying to accomplish, and specifically how to identify and deal with them. So with that in mind, let us talk, let us begin with some of the theory of negotiation. The first fundamental lesson of negotiation to understand is the difference between creating value and capturing value. This is the idea of you can, you can get a bigger slice of pie by either growing the pie itself, which would be creating value, or capturing value, meaning getting a bigger slice. And oftentimes those two agendas are at, uh, at odds with each other. We're gonna talk in a minute here about information sharing. But the idea is, you know, growing the, the pie itself can benefit both partners, but growing the, sh growing the slice uh, is where one negotiator benefits at the expense of the other, a zero sum game as economists call it. And then the last one, those are the two that you usually get from your, from your textbooks and your, and your uh, speakers on the subject. I always like to point out though that oftentimes uh, a savvy salesperson, a good negotiation, can actually manage to change the perception of value. A lot of the theoretical va uh, material here takes these two uh, like most economic models, with the assumption of economic rationality, as if everybody understands and information is perfect. And the reality is that's not true. Oftentimes you can shape people's perception of, their, of both your position and oftentimes even of their own through a variety of tactics that we're going to get to. The next thing that's important to bear in mind is what's called a BATNA. This means a best alternative to a negotiated agreement. And the common mistake that people make is they go into a negotiation without knowing what their alternative is. It, and without knowing your alternative, you don't know what, at what point you should stop negotiating, what's a good deal or what's a bad one. And it's amazing, sometimes you charge into a negotiation, you didn't ever really stop to think about what's my alternative. And that's essentially your, uh, it can be your reservation price, the price at which you would walk away. Although it's not always priced, there's a lot of terms that we're gonna get to. Um, the other thing it's important, so even if the people who, uh, the other thing to bear in mind is even those who figure out their own BATNA, it's also important to understand your, uh, the other party's BATNA, to understand their best alternative, because that, that will tell you how much negotiating strength you have relative to them. Next thing I wanted to talk about under some of the theory and tools is uh, what I call shift to value. Um, i running out of space here. What this really means is you shift the... Uh, the part of the negotiation, the component of the deal to the person who values it most. And oftentimes you can create a trade. So for example, if one party is particularly risk averse, they want to avoid the risk, then the other party takes on more of the risk with relatively uh, more of the reward, more of the upside. Which brings us to upside. Sometimes uh, if one party thinks that this, this, is a sh you know, this is a sure thing, it's gonna be a huge success, and the other party says, you know, I'm not so sure it's only going to be a moderate success, then the party who, who is more skeptical says, well, I'll take a larger share of the, initial, uh, the, of the initial benefit, and anything above that, the party who uh, is more optimistic can take a larger share of. And so what they would have effectively done is trade for, they've shifted the value to the people who values it most. Um, the person who is uh, more skeptical gets a larger share of the initial, optimist gets more of the upside. And you can also do this in terms of publicity. So for example, if, if one person really values their reputation or if they're high profile in their company or in their industry and the other party is somebody that nobody's ever heard of, you can have the person who is more interested in publicity get a better uh, 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 perception, a, a better publicity out of the deal, uh, make it appear as though they got the better end of the deal, and the other person can be compensated uh, with, with uh, a greater share of some of these other things. Now, the important thing to, to do is if you have someone who says, look, uh, 
uh, you know, you say, hey, I think this is really risky. And they say, nah, it's not really that risky. You can always say to them one sided, well then great. You won't mind taking the risk then. Like this product, I'm worried it'll break. And they'll say, no, 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 these things never break. And they go, great. Then you'll assume the responsibility if it does. And that's the classic uh, expression, putting your money where your mouth is. But it's better as in some of those examples that I gave earlier to find a place, that's a one-sided um, shift of value. Um, oftentimes you'll have to trade. So for example, if you're on the other side of that, you say, no, it's not gonna break. Okay, I'll accept the risk for breakage, but then you have to offer me something in return, something that you don't value, but I do. So that's the shift to value. And the interesting thing is this creates two counterintuitive conclusions, observations. One of them is that, uh, you know, we think that if, if there are differences of value, it'll be a more difficult negotiation. That's a good uh, 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 typical intuition. But in reality, the opposite is true. You can actually create more value, grow the pie by switching things, by trading people, uh, by trading parties for what they value most. So, you know, some of these examples I get like, you know, the optimist versus the skeptic trading uh, initial versus upside, that would, that would actually cr grow the pie. They're creating value there. Likewise, complicated negotiations counterintuitively can actually be better. If it was simple and there's only one factor like price, we can't create much value because one more dollar for me is one fewer dollars for you if it's only price. But if there's price and financing and uh, warranties and guarantees, uh, the more the more op the more factors you have in a negotiation, the more opportunity there is for um, creating value. So the complications can actually be good as well. Last thing I want to talk about from the sort of textbook example is what uh, is what I call the pattern of anchoring and concessions. Anchoring is essentially your starter price. So I think it's worth 100 and you say it's worth 50. We have anchored. Now, there are a lot of questions about whether or not you should be the first one to anchor. Maybe you want them to uh, put forth the first value. But then if they put forth an aggressive value, you might feel, you know, and, you, and you, then you put forth an aggressive value, you're going to be really far apart and it might not seem like you're able to come to a, an agreement. The other, th so there's a lot of uh, topics I can talk about under anchoring. Also, there's a pattern of concessions. So for example, if I'm at 100 and you're at 50 and you say, okay, how about 55? Generally speaking, the level of concessions decrease over time. So if you give me from 50 to 55, it's unlikely the next time will be more than an increment of five units again. It'll probably be three or four. So you're telling me that essentially 60 is about how high you would go. And it's important to understand how to read those. And it's important to understand uh, what messages you're sending as you make concessions. If you make a $5 concession, and I say that's ridiculous, we're not even talking, and then you make a $10 concession, you've told me that you were uh, acting very aggressively and that perhaps you might be acting in bad faith. So you lose credibility and there's a, there's a duality there that you have to face about when you make a concession of, um, you know, the bigger concession, the increase the likelihood of agreement, but the lower the reward of the agreement. And that brings me to my next point, which is choices. As my uh, negotiation professor once said, um, the first thing you need to understand about negotiation is just about everything cuts both ways. There's advantages and disadvantages to each idea. The first one is, do you share information or not? If you don't share information, if you don't tell the other party what you find more valuable, it's hard to create value because they don't know what to shift. You don't know how to make trades. But it's also important to note that if you unilaterally disarm, if you share all of your information with them and they don't share any with you, they now know everything that you know, but you don't know anything that they know and they have an informational advantage. And therefore they can oftentimes act, uh, uh, they can use a little bit of a, a aggressive negotiation to mislead you about what they value. Classic example of, and, and oftentimes if you think that both parties want the same thing. There's a rule of thumb that says the first one to ask for it ends up paying for it. Because if you say, well, you know, we're working on an agreement to buy a green car, I'd rather have a red, or, but I'd rather have a red car, but the red car is better for them as well. Now they're going to say it's worse so that they can extract a concession from you. So, so that's important to bear in mind. There's a lot of talk we can do about information sharing. Uh, some other things that cut both ways are, uh, do you want to be an aggressive negotiator or a passive negotiator? An aggressive negotiator might be able to intimidate their opponent, um, a bluff effectively, but they also might offend a more confident opponent. 
Likewise, passive might sound bad, but oftentimes it can lead you to being underestimated. Counter to that is it can also lead you to being taken for granted. Let's talk about do you want to appear smart or do you want to appear dumb? If you're, uh, if you're smart, uh, people might not try and take advantage of you because they assume that you're smart. But if you play dumb, you might be underestimated again and then you can uh, uh, negotiate a stronger position from that perspective. There's a, a lot of people like to play dumb. That you can also appear strong or appear weak. The advantage of appearing strong is that you, uh, you might intimidate them. The advantage of appearing weak is, look, maybe I have to ask my boss for permission and you can sort of drag out through some of those theatrics. It's important to note, I didn't put this up here on the board, there's also an issue of you can ask crazy or uh, sane. And you know, if, you're cra if you seem crazy, that might be good if you're looking at a sort of brinksmanship situation, a mutually assured destruction situation, because they're gonna be afraid that you might do something irrational. So if, if it's in your interest, like I said, if your interests are aligned with them, as I said in information sharing, acting crazy and acting irrational might be a way of getting out of paying for those things. You can also appeal resolute. I can't move, this is all I can do. Uh, and the, uh, versus being flexible. The advantage of being resolute is you're anchoring from a strong perspective and you're giving weak concessions. So you're more likely to get a good deal, but you are less likely to get a deal overall. You can uh, also, if you're working with a team like your company, you can put forth a united front where you go ahead and get everybody, everybody agrees, this is what we're gonna do. But then as you get into the negotiation, it's difficult because you've lacked flexibility and if anything changes, you have to go get everybody else's approval again. So maybe it's better to leave it nebulous. Um, and all of these things, I, I, if you were in the entertainment business, these would be what they would call your act, is sort of the, the positioning you take uh, from a personal perspective, not necessarily a financial perspective, your, your persona. And it's important to note that the uh, comfort, that, that oftentimes we come to our act not because we sat down and thought rationally about it, but just because it's our comfort zone. It's the way we naturally are, or it's the way that's been, we, has worked for us in the past. And it's important to note that ideally, we would actually be adaptable, and we would be able to adapt these based on our, um, the other party that we're negotiating with and the circumstances. I found very few people are actually uh, adaptable. Most of us are sort of one-trick ponies. Now let's move on uh, a little bit into some of the tactics that you can adopt. We've talked a lot about information sharing, so the question arises then, how do you get info? Well, the great news is, a lot of people like to tell you their story. All you have to do is ask. And as a matter of fact, uh, that we oftentimes go through life where you know, no, we feel like nobody listens to us, everybody's trying to force their views on ours. And so to actually have someone want to listen to us feels like a relief. And we let the floodgates open and tell them everything about ourselves and our position and what we want. And so the good news is people's intuition, people's sort of natural desire fits uh, in term, what we need. And oftentimes you don't have to share as much. They sort of do this unilaterally. Um, the other thing is if you get them, to, my father always says, if you get people talking, they're liable to just say too much. So oftentimes the, the habit of talking, um, uh, loose li lips sink ships. But if they're your opponent, um, on the other side of the table, uh, the, the, it might be uh, to your advantage. And then the, um, also, sometimes you can use the silence. Uh, if people st are saying something and they stop and you go, they will then be uncomfortable with that silence and they will keep talking to fill it. So you can use that to extract a little more information out of them. And then finally, under getting information, just ask them a lot of questions. This sort of is a variation of people wanting to tell their story. Just, just ask them what they think and they'll be happy to tell you. The next issue we want to talk about under tactics is framing. Oftentimes people will go into a negotiation much like neglecting to think about their, their batnas, their opponent batnas, they won't really think about what, the, the, they'll walk in with a bit of a blank page, not knowing what their main factors are, figuring that they'll figure it out as they go along. And the reality is if you have in mind the norms, the, the way to frame the discussion, uh, things like what the major issues are, and you can pick the issues that are most important to you, or um, you know, if, you wanna move, if you decide it's to your benefit to move fast versus slow, another choice that you have to make, um, you, you can set the schedule based on moving quickly. And remarkably, people walk in with a blank slate and you offer them a framing of, of the issue. And oftentimes they won't even think to uh, challenge it. They'll just accept it because they, you know, they won't stop and take a step back and reframe it their own way. So you can frame it to your advantage by doing a little work ahead of time. Also, leading from the middle. 
it's easy if you're representing your company or some or, or your organization to see the the person on the other side of the negotiation table as like you are their um, opponent. But it's important to remember that oftentimes, you, if you're really looking, if you there's a high premium getting a deal and you're not being very aggressive about how much of a deal, it's oftentimes beneficial to try and bring their side to your own organization. And you, you know you lead from the middle. You don't think of yourself as an advocate. You think of yourself as a facilitator. And you try and get, and that's what's called leading from the middle. And then the last one here is, uh, I, this is really sort of a way to decide which of the tactics to use. Uh, and also sometimes which of the choices to make. I, I talk about there's a big difference between a negotiation that's discreet, meaning we're going to do this one deal and I'll probably never see these people again, versus repeat, uh, I, we're going to do this one deal right now, but we work in the same industry, so I'm probably going to see them again versus continuous, meaning we're agreeing to develop something together as a joint venture and we're going to be seeing these people every day and working with them. That can affect a lot of the decision. You know, do you want to feel smart or dumb or do you want to be aggressive or passive? That can be affected based on what the actual outcome is going to be. So now let's move on. Those are some tactics. I've actually got several more tactics, but uh, just for the sake of the sample, I'll leave them out. I could probably do a, an entire presentation just on tactics. But let's move on to people. And this is sort of dealing with people, and the first person you want to consider is yourself. And no, I don't mean in terms of being self-involved. I mean as you want to think about your predispositions. What are you like? Are, are, are you making conscious choices, or are you biasing your behavior based on your own personal uh, uh, predispositions? So the first one you should ask yourself is how do you see others? Um, oftentimes you see others as you see yourself. So really honest people assume that everybody else is acting in good faith and is honest as well. That's not necessarily true. It's good to remove yourself from that bias. Conversely, people who are crooks always think everybody's trying to take advantage of them. That might not be the case. So you want to remove yourself. You want to, you want to be self-aware of that temptation and not see other people as yourself. Also, you want to consider your predispositions. Are you someone who likes a good argument? Do you seek conflict? Conversely, do you avoid conflict at all costs and give anything to stay away from it? People will, who are savvy negotiators will recognize that and use that to their advantage and your expense. So you want to be aware of that and affect your and, and maybe control it and maybe base your tactics uh, on, on what your comfort zone is. Um, likewise, some people are suspicious and some people are uh, naturally trusting. Same, same type of thing there. Next, I want to talk about, uh, so we've talked about you, let's talk about the other party in your negotiation. Let's talk about them. Oftentimes, it's good to know where they're coming from, not just their predispositions, but oftentimes you want to know, are they a true believer, which means that they might be adamant about doing something on principle and there's no real flexibility for them, or are they pragmatists, like, look, I'm really just here to uh, come up with some middle ground and I'm fine with that. And your tactics might change based on which one you're dealing with. So for example, for a true believer, it's much more important to be persuasive. Whereas a pragmatist might be all business, let's just, you know, what do you want? You anchor high, I anchor low. Let's meet in the middle and have lunch. Likewise, if a true believer is really intransigent, they're really in a disagreeing position with you, you might have to do more aggressive tactics like going over their head, working around there, making a public stink, things like that. Um, and the last one I want to talk about, but not the least, are the psycho-egotistical elements. These are um, things like uh, our need for control, our concern about our reputation, our ego. Perhaps we, are, we, we, we desire, we put a high premium on re relationships. We want to be in a position of power. It's very important for us to be consistent. And these are sort of psycho-egotistical uh, components. And the most important thing, both in you and your opponent, uh, pardon me, opponent, probably a more aggressive term, the other party, is to understand that oftentimes psycho-egotistical trumps these rational economic values. And so if you're dealing with someone who is uh, very, uh, is a control freak, oftentimes they'll say no, even if it's a good deal, because they feel it was rushed on them and they're not in control. So you have to, might have to adjust your behavior accordingly. Um, let's, now let's talk a little bit about a variation of people, which is I call diplomacy. Um, it's important to note that as I talk about diplomacy, I'm going to give some tips, but that assumes that you wish to be diplomatic. Sometimes if you're, if you're being more aggressive and you're trying to bluff uh, or seem crazy, you, this might not be the, be the things to listen to. But generally speaking, uh, they are. And you should understand that most people feel that they must be heard 
before hearing. They're not really going to listen to you until you've listened to them. So this, this can be a good, be a good thing because we talked information is good and uh, we want them to get them to tell us as much information as we can. So be happy to listen to them and then they will feel that they've been heard and that they might be uh, much more willing to listen to you and much more open-minded. Um, the next thing that I think you want to consider is you want to uh, separate the person from the position. So for example, you don't want to say, you are wrong. You want to say, I'm not so sure that position is supported by the data that we have. And so you want to separate the person from the position because you don't want these egotistical factors involved. And an, another element of that, so that builds to my next point, which is, you know, it's better to say the position is wrong than the person is wrong. Sometimes you can just skip over saying that it's wrong at all. You can say, we have a different opinion. Not necessarily a more valid, but a different opinion. And uh, one of the common tricks that they teach nowadays, they say, they say, don't say yes, but, say yes, and. Personally, I feel that's a little trite, and when someone gives me that rap, it, uh, uh, and then they go on to say something that contradicts what I say, I feel it's a, a, a little bit uh, almost d dishonest. Um, but what I like to point out is that oftentimes you can skip all of those contrasting qualifiers. So you don't have to say but, you don't have to say however, you don't have to say nonetheless, you'd be amazed how little you actually need them. So instead of saying yes but, you say huh, that's how you see it. Our position is, and you just skip over all of the contradictory words. And uh, it, like I said, it's amazing how little you need them. So that's a little bit on dealing with people. Let's talk a little bit about some of the darker side. And I always like to emphasize these, uh, not because I'm a particularly sinister person, but because I feel like, uh, you know, in, in the popular culture of business education, it's always politically correct to assume the best in everyone. And the truth is, that's not always the case. That's how I see it. So. Let's talk about some scenarios under which people might be acting in bad faith. Oftentimes they're, not, they're negotiating not because they really seek an agreement, but because they just want to get enough info from you. They want to know about your business, they want to know what your priorities are, and oftentimes they're learning what you're, they're, they're inherently opposed to you and they're getting that info so that they can use it against you later or with a third party. They can trap you into saying something you, uh, silly. They can make you feel comfortable so that you'll admit something that you shouldn't. They will provoke you by saying something uh, contrary, offensive and then get you to uh, embarrass yourself with an exaggerated reaction. So, so always watch out for people who aren't acting in good faith there. Another issue is, um, I call this the your option value. Option value being a financial term that I've applied here. Uh, in, in other words, they're not really necessarily interested in negotiating this one agreement but they're just always happy to have you keep coming back and giving them options and uh, they're always happy to have you uh, do their work for them do all the legwork but they're not really interested in uh, they're not interest vested in any one negotiation to use a relationship analogy gee, this is like the guy who has the girl upstairs who always calls her when he need, when she needs something fixed and uh, one night she asked him out to have a drink because her regular bo boyfriend wasn't around and now this guy is convinced that they have a relationship and the reality is they're just getting used they're getting led on you want to avoid that uh, one of the ways you can identify these people is they're always happy to talk to you but they're never willing to put in any work and they're certainly never willing to take any risk or, or do you any favors um, the next thing you want to watch out for is there are some people who only do one-sided deals. You know, if they're uh, a seller and they're always negotiating, uh, th they might, uh, the, there's a, a variety of schools of thought. One of them is the Walmart model, which is we make a little bit of money, but we charge a low price and charge everybody the same price. The other idea is, uh, the more sophisticated is, you're in a business where you can do what's called price discriminate. The people who are willing to pay more, you charge more for. People who are less, you manage to get less out of them, but you, you don't give the same price because you wanna, you wanna uh, get more from the people who are willing to pay it. But sometimes if you can't price discriminate or you're uh, not, not, not skilled enough to price discriminate, some people just go into deals where it's like, look, uh, it's like, uh, like a, a slugger in the baseball team. They only swing for home runs. They always swing for the fences. It's either a home run or no deal. And there are people like that who will only take a deal where they're really taking advantage of you. And it's frustrating because uh, the mistake you often make is you end up trying to negotiate a reasonable price and they're just not really that interested. It's sort of a take it or leave it. And any negotiation you do is uh, just uh, a waste of your time. Um, one of the ways you... Uh, uh, let's go from uh, uh, what the one-sided to 
um, people who try and trap you into commitments. So once you commit to a deal, then they try and stick it to you in the devil's in the detail. And oftentimes they'll agree to a deal that is superficially a good deal so, because they know that then you're going to tell your boss and you're going to announce it publicly and now you're committed to it and they can just nickel and dime you on all the details. So that's the devil in the details trap. Um, the other issue is the people who always want to renegotiate. They will, uh, you know, they'll take it's sort of a variation of the commitment trap. Once you're in a deal, they'll come to you and say, "Look, this just we thought it would work for us, but now it won't. We need to renegotiate. Um, it's not, it's not enough for us." And my classic uh, take on that is. Uh, the first question you should always ask them if they say, hey, we're not making money, we need a little more here. You always say, if you were so you're making less money than you're expected, so you're asking for more. If you were making more money than you expected, would you come back and offer it to take less? And uh, that, that's uh, usually a good litmus test for that. Um, and then for the last one, let's talk a, a little, oh, the last couple. First of all, there's the talk you out of. Um, if someone is not interested in doing a deal or it's only going to be a one-sided deal, meeting with them is pointless. It only allows them the opportunity to talk, that, talk you into their position. And this is easy to tell because you'll notice that they will never make any concessions. They concede nothing. The danger though is if the really savvy ones are always very good, sincere listeners before they ignore your points completely. And so oftentimes you'll feel you're being heard when in fact you're not. And the last one is sort of a variation of that, which is, um, uh, that is an old expression. Uh, you're, you're assuming there's a difference between excuses and reasons. And that's a variety of the talk out. Um, when you bring up a point, they will never, you'll notice in the negotiation, they never say, hmm, that's a good point. Okay, I guess I owe you something for that. It's always, well, that's a good point, but, and then they give a reason not to. And then you knock down that reason and they make another. And you knock down that reason and you make another. And you realize this is all a charade. They're not really reasons. They're just making excuses. They're not going to move at all. So uh, I hope you found this interesting. This is my sample on negotiation. If you'd like this presented at your organization or event, please contact me at keithwhite.com for a proposal. I look forward to doing business with you.